Everyone thinks electric vehicles are the answer to our fossil fuel addiction. But what if I told you they're actually making us more dependent on fossil fuels? And that's not even the scary part. Your entire neighborhood could go dark when EVs take over. Stay tuned, because this is going to challenge everything you thought you knew about our electric future. Hey there, my curious energy explorers. Theodore here, ready to shock your systems with some eye-opening truths about electric vehicles. We're joined by experts who've dug deep into the data, and what they've found might make you rethink everything you believed about EVs. From surprising spikes in natural gas demand to potential neighborhood blackouts, we're pulling back the curtain on the real impacts of our electric vehicle future. Get ready, this one's going to be electrifying. Hey everyone and welcome back. We're diving deep into the world of electric vehicles today. Oh yeah. Specifically their batteries. Right. Um, and you know what happens to those batteries after they've driven their last mile? Okay. You're probably thinking Second Life EV batteries, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's exactly what we're going to unpack today. Awesome. And to help us with this, we've got some McKinsey articles. Great. Um, so get ready for some surprising stuff. Right. Really interesting new perspective on electric vehicles. I'm going forward to it. So one thing that really jumped out at me from these articles was mm -hmm. that switching to EVs might not solve our oil problem oh, really? as quickly as we think. Interesting. Yeah, it's not as simple as just getting rid of gas cars. Yeah, I mean, it's tempting to think that, right. that you know, EVs are in and oil is out. Yeah. But it's more complicated than that. It is. Yeah, internal combustion engines, they're actually becoming much more fuel efficient. Oh, okay. And the cars themselves are getting lighter. So we're getting better with the technology we already have. Yeah, exactly. So you're saying those two factors together? Yeah. That means oil demand isn't going to plummet overnight. Right, even with EVs becoming more popular. Okay, so the transition to electric vehicles yeah. is going to be more gradual than yeah. some people might expect. I think so. Okay, well, here's where it gets even more interesting. Okay. These articles predict that wow. natural gas demand will increase wow. as we move towards electric vehicles. Oh, wow. So it's like a seesaw? Yeah, down on oil, yeah. up on natural gas. Exactly. It's all connected. It is. Think about it. Okay. More EVs equals a greater need for electricity. Of course. And in the U.S., natural gas is expected to be the main source for all that new electricity demand. And these articles even give a specific example. Oh, yeah. Like if half... Of all the cars in the U.S. were electric. Okay. Daily demand for natural gas would jump by more than 20%. 20%? Yeah. Okay, let me break this down in a way that'll blow your mind. Imagine you're trying to cut down on sugar, so you switch to artificial sweeteners. But plot twist, making those sweeteners actually requires more sugar. That's basically what's happening with EVs. We're trying to use less oil but we're accidentally creating a massive demand for another fossil fuel, natural gas. It's a classic case of solving one problem while creating another. Wild, right? That's, that's huge. I know that's a massive shift. Yeah. And it just goes to show how interconnected our energy systems are. Right. You can't change one part without affecting everything else. Exactly. And speaking of interconnected systems, yeah. the articles also talk about a potential land squeeze. A land squeeze. Yeah. As more and more people drive EVs. Okay. It's not like we can just swap gas stations for charging stations. It's definitely not EVs. <laughs> they need way more energy to charge mm -hmm. than it takes to just fill up a gas tank. So simply replacing gas stations won't work. Right. So then where will all the charging stations go? That's the question. Especially in places like Europe and China. Yeah. Where people don't have as much access to private charging. Yeah. And the articles highlight that only 40% uh, of EV owners in Europe already, and 30% in China yow. have access to private charging. That's so different from the U.S. No, it's a huge difference in yeah. the U.S. 75%. 75% of China. EV owners can charge at home. That's a big gap. Yeah, so how are they planning to handle this? Well, China's taking a very direct approach. Okay. Top down. Okay. They've set a goal uh -huh. to have 4.8 million charging stations by 2020. Wow. And they'll probably achieve it. 
Yeah. Through government mandates and incentives. Interesting. It'll be interesting to see how that works out. Yeah. The articles also mentioned some really cool ideas. Like what? Like large retail-driven charging stations. Retail-driven. Yeah. Imagine plugging in your car while you're at the grocery store. Oh. It's kind of like how shopping malls work today. I see. You know, with big anchor stores to attract people. Yeah, that's a great analogy. It just shows that we need creative solutions. Definitely. To integrate EV charging into our cities and towns. Yeah, okay, so we've talked about oil. Uh-huh. We've talked about land. Right. Now let's get to the heart of EVs. Okay. The batteries. The batteries, the batteries. Yeah, as you might guess, battery cost is a major obstacle. Totally. To widespread EV adoption. Yeah. I mean, batteries are a huge part of an EV's total cost. How much? Somewhere between 40% and 50%. Wow. So for EVs to really compete with gas-powered cars yeah. on price, mm -hmm. battery costs need to come down. They do. Right. For sure. And the McKinsey article say that currently battery costs are about 200 to $225 per, per kilowatt hour. Okay. To reach the same price point as combustion engine vehicles. Okay. They need to get down to seventy-five to hundred dollars per kilowatt hour. Seventy-five to hundred dollars. That's the sweet spot. That's the sweet spot for mass market. Yeah, for mass market adoption. Okay, so reaching that lower price mm -hmm. is super important. It is. But then there's another thing. Okay. The raw materials. Oh yeah. Like cobalt. Yeah. And lithium. Right. That are needed to make the batteries. Huh. I read that demand for these materials. Yeah. Has skyrocketed. Because of? Because of all this EV production, right. which, of course, drives up prices. Yeah, you're right. The cost of cobalt and lithium. It's more than double since 2015. Wow. Which directly affects EV production costs. So is there hope? Oh, yeah. Are we going to be stuck no, in a battery bottleneck? We shouldn't jump to conclusions about scarcity. Okay. There are ways around this. Okay, so what are we doing? Well, the industry is looking into alternative battery chemistries Okay. that don't rely so much on these rare materials. So less cobalt and lithium. Exactly. And we could always increase mining efforts. But of course, that comes with yeah. its own consideration. Exactly. Things like environmental and social impacts. Especially in those places where these materials are mined. Yeah, like Africa and South America. It's a complex issue. It is. With a lot of factors to consider. Right. It's not just about the materials themselves, mm -hmm. but also the money needed to scale up mining. And doing it responsibly? Responsibly, yes. We need to think about the whole supply chain. Okay. From the mine to the factory and make sure it's sustainable. Okay, so we've talked about oil land yeah. and batteries. Right. Now let's talk about the power grid. The grid. Yeah, some people are worried that all these electric vehicles are going to overload the system, right. lead to blackouts. Yeah, is that a real concern? That's a valid concern. Yeah. Okay. But these McKinsey articles actually offer some reassurance. Oh, good. Overall electricity demand yeah. won't spike dramatically. Okay. But the way we use electricity will change. You mean the load curve? Yes. The way electricity demand goes up and down throughout the day. Exactly. So picture this. It's a typical weekday evening. Right. People are coming home from work, turning on lights, cooking dinner, maybe doing laundry. Right. That's already a peak demand time. Yeah. Now add millions of EVs plugging in to charge at the same time. Oh, wow. And suddenly yeah. the grid is under a lot more pressure. The articles highlight that local grids. Okay. Especially in the suburbs. Where there's a lot of EV charging. Yeah, those areas will face the biggest challenges. They even give an example from Germany okay. where EV growth is expected to increase peak load by just 1% by 2030. 1%. But then by 5% by 2050. 5%. Okay, so manageable nationally. Right. But what about those local grids? Well, for a typical residential feeder circuit okay, with 25% EV penetration, okay. the peak load could jump by around 30%. 30%? That's a lot. It is. And it could push transformers yeah. beyond their capacity. Think of your neighborhood's power grid like a water pipe. It works fine when everyone uses a normal amount of water. But now imagine everyone decides to fill their swimming pool at the same time. That's basically what happens when all your neighbors plug in their EVs after work. Suddenly that pipe, or in our case, the power grid, is trying to handle way more than it was built for. And just like a bursting water pipe, an overloaded grid can leave everyone high and dry, or in this case, in the dark. So what can we do 
to prevent blackouts yeah and make sure the grid can handle all these electric vehicles there are some promising solutions okay tell me more one is time of use tariffs okay which encourage ev owners to charge their cars during off-peak hours so like late at night yeah exactly think of it like happy hour for electricity i like that cheaper rates when demand is low and the article suggests that this could cut the peak load increase in half yeah that's pretty good it, it what else are there other solutions another solution is co-locating energy storage with transformers it's like a giant battery yes next to the transformer that powers my street exactly this co-located storage acts as a buffer Okay. It absorbs energy when demand is low uh -huh. and releases it during peak hours. It's like a giant backup battery for the whole neighborhood. Exactly. Pretty cool, right? Very cool. What else? And then there's the option of using combined heat and power plants. Okay. Which can generate both electricity and heat. At the same time. More efficiently. Okay. This can be really useful oh. in areas where there's demand for heat. Oh, okay. Like residential neighborhoods? Exactly. Or industrial facilities. So it seems like there are lots of ways yeah. to tackle these grid challenges. What are? It's just a matter of implementing the right solutions. Right, in the right places. Exactly. It requires everyone to work together, oh. energy providers, policymakers, oh. even EV owners. It's a team effort. It is. Okay, so we've covered oil, yeah. batteries, right. and the power grid. Now let's finally get to the main event. The main event. Second Life EV Batteries. What exactly are they? Okay, so imagine this. Okay. Your EV battery. Yeah. It's reached the end of its life in your car. Okay. It doesn't hold enough charge uh -huh. or charge fast enough okay. for your daily commute. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's ready for the trash. It's like a veteran retiring from active duty. Yeah. But still having a lot to offer. Exactly. EV batteries can have a second life. Okay. Even after they're done powering cars. So we take those batteries out of cars. Yeah. And use them to store energy on a bigger scale. Exactly. Okay. There are three main options for EV batteries. At the end of their life in the car? Yeah, at the end of their first life. Okay. Disposal, recycling, uh -huh. or reuse. Disposal seems like the worst option. It is, and in a lot of places, regulations prevent it anyway. Good. Recycling is a good choice. When? When the battery has valuable metals like cobalt and nickel. But reusing the batteries. Giving them a second life. Yeah. That offers the most value. Err in markets where there's a need for stationary energy storage. So where do these Second Life batteries really shine? They're great in three main areas. Okay. First, they can provide reserve energy capacity mm -hmm. for utilities. Backup power. Yeah, helping to keep the grid reliable. At a lower cost. At a lower cost than traditional systems. Okay, what's the second area? Second, they can help us avoid expensive grid upgrades. Especially in those places yeah. where we're talking about potential overload from EV charging. Right. Instead of upgrading the grid, uh -huh. you can use Second Life batteries to even out the load. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. And the third area? The third area is power arbitrage with renewables. Power arbitrage. Yeah. It's like playing the stock market. Okay. But with electricity. Interesting. You buy low and sell high. Okay. We can use these batteries to store cheap renewable energy. When it's abundant. Yeah, like when it's sunny or windy. Okay. And then we sell it back to the grid. When demand is high. Exactly. And prices are higher. So this makes renewable energy more reliable uh -huh. and more profitable. Yes. And I bet using Second Life batteries for this makes it even more cost effective. You're right. The McKinsey article states that in 2025, okay. Second Life batteries could be 30% yeah. to 70%. Wow. Less expensive than new batteries for these types of applications. That's a huge cost advantage. I know. That's a game changer. It could make renewable energy more accessible to everyone. Okay. But, of course, there are some challenges yeah. to repurposing these batteries. Of course, it's not a perfect solution. Like we talked about earlier, Bruh. there's a huge variety of battery design. Yeah, and not all batteries are created equal. Right. That's a big challenge. Yeah. Every car manufacturer. And battery maker. Right has their own specifications. Making it hard to standardize repurposing. Exactly. And then there's the issue of falling costs for new batteries. So as new batteries become cheaper. Yeah, the cost advantage of Second Life batteries shrinks. So it's a race against time. It is. To get these Second Life batteries into the market. Right. Well, they still have a significant cost advantage. Exactly. What else? What other challenges are there? Well, there's also a lack of industry standards for Second Life batteries. So no guarantee of quality. Right. Or performance. Making it tough for buyers to know what they're getting. Exactly. And the regulatory environment is still developing. 
So no clear guidelines on who's responsible for what right. when it comes to reusing or recycling these batteries. Yeah, that's a lot to figure out. It is, but I'm sure people are working on solutions. They are. Some companies are already leading the way. Like who? Like Nissan. Okay. They've partnered with Sumitomo Corporation okay. to reuse batteries from their LEAF model for stationary storage systems. And Renault has their advanced battery storage program yes which is a collaboration uh. to create a 70 megawatt 60 megawatt hours installation in europe by 2020 that's impressive it is and these are just a couple of examples mm -hmm. more and more companies are realizing the potential of second life ev batteries and finding ways to overcome the obstacles exactly so it sounds like we're on the verge of a big shift yeah. in the energy storage market. I think so. With Second Life EV batteries leading the charge. It's definitely a space to watch. I think we'll see even more innovation and collaboration. In the coming years. Absolutely. But for now, let's take a break. Yeah. We've covered a lot of ground. We have. When we come back, yeah. we'll explore the potential of Second Life EV batteries even further. So, and how they might revolutionize the way we think about energy storage and renewable energy. Looking forward to it. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We spent the first part of our deep dive looking at some of the unexpected things that come with electric vehicles. Right, right. Now we're going to focus on those EV batteries. Okay. And how they can have a whole second act. A second act. Even after they're not powering cars anymore. I like that. You know, it's amazing how these Second Life EV batteries, uh -huh. they're kind of like a circular economy. Yeah. For electric vehicles. Okay. We're talking about getting more value out of these batteries. Right. Way beyond their initial use. It's like getting two products for the price of one. Exactly. It's all about maximizing those resources. Yeah. And it ties into that bigger idea of sustainability. Right. Reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. It's a big deal. Absolutely. We talked about some of the challenges of repurposing these batteries before. We did. But let's talk solutions. Okay. These articles suggest that car companies could actually design EVs. Yeah with Second Life applications in mind. Oh, from the very beginning. Yeah, right from the start. That's interesting. So if manufacturers think about how these batteries might be used later, uh -huh. it could make repurposing so much easier. And more efficient. Exactly. It's like planning for the future. Right. Like when you build a house and you make sure you can easily convert the attic into a living space later. Oh, okay. You're thinking ahead. Right. Planning for flexibility. I like that. And it's not just design. Yeah. It's about industrializing the whole remanufacturing process. So instead of having all these small operations right. trying to figure things out on their own, yeah, exactly. we need a more streamlined approach. You need a standardized approach yeah. to repurposing. To make everything more efficient. Exactly. And that's where industry standards come in. Okay. If we have clear guidelines. For what? For the performance and safety of Second Life batteries. Okay. It will make buyers feel more confident. They'll know what they're getting. Exactly. Think of it like a certification program. Like an energy star rating? Yeah, exactly. But for repurposed batteries. Right. Consumers will know what to expect. That makes sense. And of course, we need supportive regulations. Oh, absolutely. Governments can really help uh -huh. by creating incentives, yeah. setting clear guidelines, uh -huh. and making sure recycling and reuse is done responsibly. It sounds like a multi-pronged approach. It is. We need car makers. Yeah battery manufacturers, well, energy providers, and policymakers. All working together. It takes a village. It does, but the potential benefits are huge. Speaking of benefits, yeah, yeah. let's talk about the economic and environmental benefits yeah. of these Second Life batteries. Right. We already talked about the cost advantage. Right, well, cost. But what about the bigger picture? Well, economically, yeah. Second Life batteries can create new revenue streams. For who? For both the car industry and the energy industry. Okay, so for car companies. Yeah. It's a way to get even more value out of their cars. Even after they're sold. Exactly. And for energy providers. Yeah, it's a cheaper and more sustainable way to store energy. Which can help them manage the grid better. And integrate more renewables. That's a win-win. It is. And environmentally, uh, yeah. reusing these batteries means we don't have to mine as many new materials. Right, which is better for the environment. And for communities and mining regions. It also keeps those batteries out of landfills. Yeah, where they could leak harmful chemicals. So it's a more responsible approach all around. It is. It's it's a solution that's good for the economy and the environment. It's amazing how these Second Life batteries are shaking up the energy storage market. I know. It's a really interesting area to watch. And we're just seeing the beginning of what they can do. I think so. You've been really deep in this world of electric vehicles and energy storage. I have. What's the most significant thing you've seen? 
You know what's really fascinating to me? What? Is how all these different industries are coming together. Like who? Car companies. Okay. Energy providers. Uh-huh. Tech companies. Yeah. Even material science companies. Ah. Uh. They're all working together to figure this out. It's like everyone's bringing their own expertise to the table. Yeah, to solve this complex puzzle. And it's happening all over the world. It is Europe, China, the US. They're all investing in this technology. It's a global effort. It is. It's amazing to think about all the brain power and resources mm -hmm. that are going into this. It makes me optimistic. You yeah, too. About the future of sustainable energy. Okay, so let's bring it back to the present. Right. What are some key takeaways? For our listeners. For our listeners who want to understand this world. Of Second Life Batteries. Yeah. I think the most important thing to remember. What? Is that this isn't some futuristic idea. It's happening now. It's a real solution that's gaining traction. This is real. It is. And it's a solution that tackles multiple challenges. Like what? Like re reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. Uh -huh. Creating a more sustainable energy system. Okay. And opening up new economic opportunities. So it's not just good for the planet. Right. It's good for business. It is. It helps create a more resilient future. For everyone. For everyone. Exactly. Another important takeaway. Okay. Is that we need to change how we think mm -hmm. about how we use resources. Okay. We can't just keep doing the produce use dispose thing. Yeah, we need to be more circular. Exactly. Yeah. We need to get the most value out of our resources. And find ways to reuse what we already have. Right. Be smarter with our stuff. And that applies to more than just batteries. It does. It's a powerful idea. It's inspiring to see it happening yeah. with these Second Life batteries. It is. It shows that even small changes uh -huh. can have a big positive impact. This deep dive has been so informative. It has. We've talked about the challenges. The opportunities. The economic and environmental benefits. Yeah. And how this technology could help us transition to renewables. It's been a great conversation. It has. I hope our listeners learned a lot. I think they did. But before we wrap things up, yeah. I want to leave our listeners with a question. A question? A thought-provoking question. So we talked about how Second Life EV batteries can help bring more renewable energy into the grid. Right. But what if they could actually speed up? It's true. Yeah, the transition to renewables. That's a great question. Like, could they be a catalyst for a cleaner energy future? I think so. The growing use of Second Life batteries... Mm -hmm. It could create this positive feedback loop. Like a snowball effect. Exactly. Yep. As more and more electric vehicles hit the road, yeah. we'll have more of these batteries ready for a second life. So more batteries means lower cost. Right. Lower cost for energy storage. Making it even more attractive for utilities and businesses. Exactly. To invest in renewables. Like solar and wind. Right. It just makes sense. It does. It could be a game changer for renewables. Making wind and solar more reliable yeah. and more affordable. And that would lead to even faster adoption of clean energy. It's like a chain reaction. It is Second Life batteries help unlock the full potential of renewables. And that leads to a cleaner, more sustainable energy future. Exactly. It's exciting to think about. It is. It shows how these different trends can come together uh -huh. and create something much bigger. Than we could have imagined. Yeah, it's a great example of how innovation happens. Where? At the intersection of different fields. This has been an incredible deep dive yeah. into the world of Second Life EV batteries. We've covered a lot. We have. We've talked about the challenges, the opportunities. The benefits. Yeah, the economic and environmental benefits. And how all of this could change the energy landscape. Before we go. Yeah. I want to thank you for being our guide on this journey. Oh, it's been my pleasure. You've shared some amazing insights. I've enjoyed it. And helped us understand this complex topic. That's a fascinating area. And to our listeners... Yes. We encourage you to keep exploring this topic. There's so much to learn. What are your takeaways? What questions do you still have? It's a rapidly changing field. The world of Second Life EV batteries is full of possibilities. It is. We're just at the beginning. Of an exciting journey. Who knows what amazing innovations are coming next. It's an exciting time. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. Well, my voltage varying friends, we've uncovered some shocking truths about our electric future. But don't let these challenges dim your hopes. They're just speed bumps on the road to cleaner energy. 
The real takeaway here is that every major transition comes with unexpected twists and turns. The key is staying informed and adaptable. Keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep pushing for solutions that address the whole picture, not just part of it. This is Theodore, signing off and keeping the current flowing. Until next time, stay curious and keep your mental circuits firing. <laughs>